Thank you. Uh, so once again, I'm Joseph Farbrick. I'm, I'm, I'm a digital artist uh, in, the, in the School of Art here. And I, I, I do a number of things. I mean, I teach you know, 3D modeling and animation. I'm doing a lot with augmented and virtual reality art um, and other immersive arts. But I thought it would be good to talk about digital fabrication, which is something um, somewhat new to me. I've, I've kind of had a lot of the prerequisite skills doing 3D modeling for many years. Um, but over the last few years, um, I've really gotten into digital fabrication, how you can take uh, something that you've designed on a computer and turn it into an actual object and what that means and what you can do with it and what are the ramifications in the world of art uh, using this as a, as a new kind of an art medium. Um, most people when you talk about digital fabrication, they immediately start thinking about rapid prototyping, right? Um, maybe you do something, uh, you know, you have a design idea and you could, you could design it on a computer and quickly get it into a physical form so you can show proof of concept, this thing works, this is what it would look like in your hand, um, and, and that's great. I mean, architects also use it for, for buildings, you know, to show what a building would look like, a model of a building. They can make it much faster than trying to cut it out of styrofoam like they used to before the digital tools were available. Um, and they're doing a lot of other utilitarian things. I mean, they're thinking about building roads and buildings and all that kind of stuff um, with uh, digital fabrication. Um, and it certainly holds a lot of promise in that way. And I think it is gonna kind of uh, revolutionize a lot of industry. Um, but of course, artists like to co-opt uh, these things and think about, well, what can we do with it as an art medium? And what kind of a new message is this medium gonna hold for us um, as far as um, politically, as far as meaning and concept, and uh, exploring this medium. So using, using digital fa fabrication as an art medium is a bit, I mean, you can think of it as a bit like when perhaps oil paint got discovered. It wasn't necessarily going to replace something that came before it. It became sort of another way of making art. You wouldn't try and do something that you would normally do in watercolor or sketching or even um, I don't know, making marks in stone, and then do this with oil paint and think that you're gonna duplicate this. So it, it isn't really like that so much in that it holds the promise of becoming a medium in, its, in itself and really a group of mediums, right? A group of media, I guess, if you will, because it's not just one thing. It's not just, um, it's not just 3D printing. It's not just CNC routing. It's not just laser cutting and other technologies that will be using uh, basically stepper motors is really kind of what's driving the, 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 all of it really um, is what's going on. Um, the, uh, okay, so I wanna move to the pictures now if I can, but I, are we, we're still having trouble, huh? Um, we'll start with that one. <laughs> so this was one of the first, um, experiments that I did. This is a, a um, laser etched um, plywood. <laughs> See, this is my life, technical, te technical difficulties. Being a digital artist, this is basically all I do is, is wrestle technical difficulties where um, it, it worked one day and then inexplicably doesn't work the next day. Um, so this is, this is very, all, very familiar to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this is, um, this is this laser etched plywood. This started out as an image of, of cracked earth from a riverbed here in Tucson. And I made it very high resolution in Photoshop and then used the laser cutter to um, etch it in, into plywood. And it's, you know, it's okay. It's, it's an interesting image. It probably could have been done in, in ink as well. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of something. But when I played around with the machinery itself, I slowed down the, the laser and when you cut with a laser, when you etch with a laser, it has a, uh, a vacuum in it to suck away the smoke because the smoke is going to damage the laser and it's also going to um, stain your work. But I'm interested in that. I'm interested in this glitch. I'm interested in the, the actual um, strangeness that goes on with the machinery itself, especially when you do things that maybe you're trying to avoid generally. And so slowing it down, and here's the smoke staining it, leaving through the top. I got a much better image because this has a lot, a lot more depth um, and a lot more interest in it. Um, and so that's kind of what kind of got me started in thinking like, well, these digital tools don't necessarily have to be 
so exact and so duplicating everything uh, the, the same way every time you do it. I mean, originally photographers, when they were working in dark rooms, would make a photographic print with the enlarger and they'd have to do all kinds of dodging and burning and chemicals and agitation and changing the chemicals and temperatures. And so every print would come out different. And so it was literally like creating like a painting uh, with chemistry and with you know, artistry. And so why not do that same sort of thing with these digital tools? Um, here, I'll, and I'll put both of these together now so you can kind of see the, the difference more readily. Um, so the idea is that a lot of this machinery to make digital art, to make uh, digital fabrications, is going to go obsolete. But there's going to be favorite machines that artists are going to hook onto and say, I need to have this machine, the ADXYZ, whatever it's going to be. And I only want that machine. It makes the art that I want to see. And all the stuff that came after that so much better ruins it for me. It doesn't do what I want it to do. It's like a musician that says, I need to have an old analog synthesizer from 1975. You know, it's the only thing that'll make that sound. It can't be replicated. So it's a little bit like that. I know that's going to happen now with digital tools, um, with digital machinery. Um, so here's another example of that. This is that same laser cutter. Um, this, is, this came out interesting. Again, here's the smoke leaving the image. And this time, it, it oddly worked kind of serendipitously in that it looks like here, she's, you know, gravity is affecting her, and she's, and she's leaving the air. Um, whereas for some reason it didn't really happen on these other ones where she's clearly on the ground. So oddly it only happened when she was in the air. And so sometimes these sort of things happen where you, you didn't expect something and so the, the tool itself, the medium itself, helps guide the imagery and can even help guide the concept in a way. And I think this is, this is true for a lot, of, a lot of images. And so here's another one. Um, and so this is sort of a, of a line drawing of, of fall leaves in a forest. It's kind of hard to tell where this came from. But again, I'm letting the, the smoke help determine what the piece is going to look like. Okay, so here, this is, goes into CNC routing now. I started using a CNC router. And I wanted to first experiment with very simple forms. This form right here, uh, took about five minutes for me to make on a computer. I mean, literally, it was just taking a stylus and doing some swiggles in a modeling program and exporting it and then setting up the router and setting it up for double side so that it would actually, you have to cut one side, flip it over, and cut the other side and have it all line up and be synchronized so it looks like it's all one, one piece. And I immediately thought, well, you know, now I need to sand it and you know, make it look like as if I had carved it. But I thought, wait a minute, no, I don't want to do that. I'm interested in how it cut the wood and all these little lines. It's kind of hard to tell. I think I have a more a closer image of this. Now I got another image. Um, you, well, it's kind of hard to tell from here, but, but it left all of these very striking um, patterns in the wood where the, the, the routing tool, the mill, um, rolled over it. And it's something that you really could not do carving. There's no way you can get that kind of accuracy by hand. I mean, you, you know, your, your hand wouldn't be steady enough to be able to do that. Um, and, and that's what I became interested in, is, is the texture that this left. Um, and then here's another one. This, again, took me just a few minutes to model because all this is is a bunch of spheres. Um, but you can see sort of these artifacts that the machinery left. You know, there's this, this kind of surface here, the lines that are going this way, how it's interacting with the wood texture. Um, and again, this is a double-sided, so everything kind of lines up. And so it became sort of an interesting sculpture in itself that, again, was helped guide, you know, the, the machinery helped guide uh, what was going to go on here and, and also the final result. And so I didn't want to, I was actually very careful, this one and the last one, not to dent or mar any of this because I didn't want to lose any of the marks created by the machinery. And this is another um, sort of more of a conceptual piece that, I, again, I wanted the machine to respond or to um, be kind of an offset to what was going on with this natural log. This is a piece of aspen wood uh, that I found uh, out in the forest. And then CNC routed, 
a hand that I modeled and then printed one with a kind of a crappy printer. It's one of these old maker bots um, that really dis doesn't do all that well. You can see all the lines from the layers of the 3D printing. Uh, the printers are, are, are much better these days. Um, but this is exactly what I wanted. I was very interested in showing that this is absolutely 3D printed. There's no question that this is 3D printed. Um, and the same with this, that there would be no question that this is done by a machine, that this is a, a route done by a machine, um, and this was not done by hand. So there's a lot of marks, again, from the, from the, the end mill uh, in there. And I wanted that to contrast what was going on with the texture and the, the layering of the wood and this kind of idea of, the, it was kind of this sort of discomfort uh, between something that's so organic and natural and also the forms that are organic and natural being turned into something that's mechanistic um, and, and to kind of create that contrast in there. Um, so again, you know, maybe one of these old crappy maker bots I'm going to have sitting in my studio for many, many years to come, long after you can get them on eBay for you know, 30 bucks, uh, <laughs> because I'm going to want that texture. I'm, I'm going to want this kind of thing for whatever form I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, this is a much better printer. This is one I, um, that I got later. That prints pretty, pretty well. You don't see the lines anymore. I mean, this is pretty smooth. It's, it's almost shiny smooth. But I realized that, okay, so now I've got the, you know, this hand um, that I modeled again. And there it is, done very, very well, very, very perfectly. But now I realize it's not so interesting. This could have been done in porcelain, it could have been done in clay, it could have been done in metal, it could have been done in wood, it could have been done by hand, um, you know, and sanded and all of that, and it wouldn't make any difference. It, I mean, and so why would you want to own an artwork that was made out of plastic? I mean, that's a strange medium, that's a strange material to be wanting to have something that's, that's supposedly precious and this is plastic. So how do you use plastic in a way that it will have the preciousness of an artwork, that it will show the markings of an artist, the markings of a process, the aura of the artist, if you will, which I think is something that's very important for artwork to have. Otherwise, it'll, it will be sterile. And it will be something um, that's, you know, if it's completely reproducible, it's not so interesting. When you take a photograph and you reproduce it perfectly a million times, you have a poster, right? Uh, and so this, to me, was the equivalent of the digital poster, you know, in, in a 3D form. Um, so here's another thing that happened. Again, I'm still working with hands here. You can tell this kind of motif. I'm kind of just working with this a bit. Um, and what happened here is that my end mill wasn't long enough. That's the, you know, the cutter of the router. And so it hit the cullet, which is what holds the, the end mill. So in other words, this thing came down and what holds the end mill, which is like a big bolt, and started grinding its way into the wood. Something you really want to avoid. I mean, I suppose theoretically you could start a fire if it got too hot. Uh, so you really want to avoid this kind of thing. Um, but I had let this thing go and thought everything's working well about halfway down. I kind of left the room for a while and came back and it had ground this. Um, and I'd, I'd actually thought this was an imperfection in the wood until I kind of realized what had happened, that the depth right there was too much for the length of the end mill, and that's what ground its way in here. But then I realized, suddenly, this calls attention to what's happening here. Because normally when you have, like, let's say a bust, um, or a part of a body that's been reproduced in some kind of an artwork, you, don't, you, you sort of disregard, it becomes transparent, the fact that it's cropped, that it's been cut. Suddenly you put this damage in here and it calls attention to the, like, as if this has been chopped and this is, becomes more horrific in a way, as if this is a cut off hand, uh, perhaps a corpse's hand that has damage from a knife or some sort of a chopping device. Um, and suddenly this takes on uh, perhaps a more of a, of a macabre beating, meaning, but it, 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 it calls attention now to what's happening at the end of the artwork, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and, I, and I started also playing around with, you know, this is actual uh, a, a, a gold wedding band that I embedded into the work. So I'm kind of mixing medium a little bit there. Um, and then conceptually, again, working conceptually with, with the, the, the machinery itself. So a CNC router 
can produce a gun uh, out of metal, uh, a real gun that will shoot and will not have any kind of um, identifiable markings on it. And it, in a way, if you think about this, if consumers can make a gun by downloading some plans, let's say, off the internet and putting it in your end mill, I mean, putting it in your CNC uh, router and, and, and routing out a gun, you can, you can route out an AR-15, let's say, and nobody's even gonna know where this gun came from and no one can stop you from getting it. I mean, you think when people used to uh, download uh, illegal music, pirated music all the time, perhaps still do in, in, in many cases, or movies, well, what's to stop people from downloading even illegal uh, designs for a gun, for, for a banned gun? They would just get it on the internet, right, and make this gun. So all of the gun control arguments that's happening in, in government, uh, one one side and the other, it makes them all moot. Because suddenly you can't control it. Even if you make all these laws against owning a particular gun, how are you gonna stop people from just making one? Uh, especially when this becomes more and more available to the public. I mean, it's very available to the public now, but it's gonna get cheaper and cheaper to where we're gonna be making metal parts all the time for our vacuum cleaners and plumbing and things like this. I mean, that's kind of the promise of, of all this digital fabrication is that you no longer have to go out and buy something. You could just simply put it on your machine, you know, got, get on the internet, Google something up, put it on the machine and bang, there's your part. And now you can go fix your vacuum cleaner. Um, so, this idea of this, this repetition, that this is just going to go by the millions, um, is kind of what this starts to talk about. Um, on the other hand, on, on this side, we sort of have this promise that it's also going to be able to create things like tissue and bones, and that we're going to be able to replace um, organs in our body by using a printing device to scaffold up uh, bones and cells so that they can actually grow properly and we can actually make tissue. Um, this is already starting to happen quite a bit, especially with skin um, and possibly bone as well. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's going to very soon happen with full organs. Um, I think we're, we're kind of on the cusp of that right now. Um, so there's sort of a promise um, of very good things, but also some very scary things. This is the world that we live in right now. We really can't, there is no gun control, really. This, this is really what's happening right now. Um, really in the world, whether there's gun control laws or not. So that's kind of scary, but no, nonetheless, this is where we are. Um, and again, I, I wanted to, let me, hopefully I have a uh, close-up of that, yes. So again, I wanted to keep the obvious digital artifacts, the machine artifacts, um, within this organic ear that I modeled to again, very much show this is a mechanical process. This is an organic form that's been manufactured by a machine. So again, I'm using the, the texture to sort of speak about something that maybe is uh, political, perhaps. Um, something that maybe is visceral, that might get you to sort of feel a little weird and uneasy with this idea that machines are gonna be producing us or parts of us. And that's very strange and very kind of hard to wrap your head around but that's the world that we're in, whether we like it or not. As an artist, I'm very interested again in texture. This, this I don't know if anyone can recognize what this is. Um, this is uh, my, my jeans that have been thrown on the ground. And I did uh, a photogrammatic scan. In other words, I took a bunch of pictures of it and put it in, a, in software to make a 3D model where it's photogrammetry. Um, and so I got this kind of a rough scan of my jeans just for fun. I just wanna see well, what would that look like? And did sort of a, this is again that crappy MakerBot printer. Uh, uh, I, you know, and again, I've got this interesting texture and the way the light hits it. I mean, if you actually saw the object, you know, as you move the light in and around it, uh, it gets pretty interesting. So again, I'm, I'm interested in the texture and the form that starts to happen with the, the mechanistic processes. Um, I also want to show some of, well, so this is often when we, if, if you were to Google 3D or 3D printed artwork or digital fabricated fine art, you probably get an image like this pretty fast. Um, in fact, probably a lot of images that look like this pretty fast. And this is, it, it is interesting, right? I mean, it is kind of has a wow factor to it. It's got the intricacy, it's got the skull inside the skull. But again, this could be done in bone right, in ivory, in ceramics, in metal, perhaps carved in wood. And so it becomes 
maybe a faster replacement for something else. And to me, it's not as interesting as the medium itself. I mean, maybe as an object, as an art object, maybe I'd like to have this um, on a pedestal or shelf or whatever. Um, but it doesn't speak to the medium for me uh, because of the fact that this is just something that can maybe just re be replicated faster and probably very exact um, a million times and can be done in other media. On the other hand, something like this. So this is uh, done by a uh, student uh, that was going to NYU, uh, Michelle Hassel. And this is a digitally generated object. So what she did is she took a, a scanner um, attached to an iPad and went around this guy who was you know, on, on, in the streets of New York City in Brooklyn uh, serving halal food and went around and got this full color uh, scan of this guy that was turned into a 3D module by digital processes and then printed it with a color 3D printer, kind of a, again, a crappy one. It's got weird artifacts. It doesn't do the color all that well. It's a little faded out. It's a little off. And when you do a scan, there's parts that don't resolve because of the shadow that it can't, the, the computer can't figure out what's going on. So it gets kind of mushy. Um, in fact, in general, there's, there's sort of a mush factor uh, that's happening. But this is what I'm interested in, in, in that, you know, this is something that's going to be kind of a one, one of a kind. This printer, in fact, I, I started experimenting with this very printer. Um, and it's, it's a really bad, badly designed printer. It does not print the same thing twice ever. Usually the ink's off, the color's off, the model's weird, something happened that didn't happen last time. So every single print is one of a kind. And I kind of like that. Um, and so I sort of started playing around with that as well, although eventually gave up with it because it was such a poorly designed printer that it was very hard to get anything to happen. So I'll probably wait for something that's just a little better. Um, but I'm still gonna be interested in what doesn't get to be exact because it starts to make these more interesting forms. Um, this is one of my students um, that I encourage to sort of take this philosophy of let the, the machinery and form kind of help dictate what was gonna happen. And so she created this and then put a live plant in it as well to kind of be part of this. So she's kind of mixing media here. And also making contrast between uh, something that was made by a digital fabrication process and something that was made by a traditional process um, of, of probably turning uh, the material. And sort of using all this together and then hand painting as well. Uh, so she's kind of playing with a, a, a lot of different things here. Um, this other image, this is uh, much more conceptual. This, this is one of the grad students, and grad students generally are much more conceptual. Um, so this is interesting. This is by uh, Katie Smith. She um, came from a blue-collar manufacturing background, and her parents lost their jobs because of automation. And she came, became kind of fascinated with this whole process. And so she went to this um, factory, um, one of the um, uh, ceramic like toilet and sink manufacturers, like Kohler, I, I don't think it was Kohler, but it was something like that. And she, it, it, the factory had gone out of business and there was nothing there but this big kind of empty abandoned building and all these shards of um, sinks and toilets that had been left there. And that's all that's there even to this day. And she picked up a bunch of them. These are the real shards that she picked up. And then she got this idea, well, what if I scan them all and reproduce them by 3D printing and reproduce them again and again and again and again? And actually now she has thousands of these. She's kept going, going with it. She's going to be able to fill a room with them. Um, and it's, just, it's kind of weird, right, if you think about that. Why would you take something that's normally considered garbage, discard, and reproduce it again and again and again. I mean, it seems like such a sort of a ridiculous practice, but she really kind of wanted to show how this idea of, of mechanical reproducibility is affecting our lives because our jobs are being lost to mechanation 
and to mechanical reproducibility. Um, and how we are sort of being treated like just the pieces that, oh well, it's, it's just the, the byproduct. The people that lose their jobs and all of that uh, become like the shards themselves. They're discarded. They're not really thought about. And so this, this became this concept, concept that she's been working with uh, quite a bit and doing a lot of iterations of, of work. Uh, but this is one, one, one of the things that she's up to. And it, it's, it becomes overwhelming if you were to see thousands of these reproduced shards exactly alike. It becomes overwhelming. It becomes something that will become emotionally effective to, to see this. Um, and a lot of it is because we tend to ignore um, in, in small ways when something's been, uh, let's say, manufactured, it's now very cheap, and we don't really think about um, what that meant and how that affected lives, and we ignore the ramifications of it, where if you're suddenly surrounded by a thousand examples, uh, it can become much more intense, much more visceral. Um, and really kind of implanted in your, in your brain. This is something big that you really do have to wrap your brain around and think about um, you know, as, as, as something that, that, that is important. Um, okay, so that's the, the last one I wanted to show. Um, and I'm gonna continue uh, playing around with this, kind of looking for glitches, looking for things in the process, looking for uh, particular artifacts that happen from machinery. Um, I, I'm, this, is, this is one of the areas of research that I do. Um, others I do a lot with uh, virtual and augmented reality art. I'm also interested in that. Um, and, um, and a number of, a number of different uh, digital art areas. I mean, as a digital artist, I, I kind of dabble in, in all of these things, uh, both audio, video, and um, objects, all of that. Um, so, do you guys have questions? I mean, we can keep this very informal here, yeah. I want to know how worried you are about technology getting too good, right? I mean, you showed this example of like, oh, well, I've got a newer 3D printer and now yeah. it's this very perfect, you know, no mistakes kind of hand. So, uh, sure, you can keep some of the older ones around, but eventually they're going to fail and maybe you can't repair them. And, and right, so, right. So how much is it a concern to you that like, the, the ones that are kind of bad are either too bad and they, you can't even use them because they're so bad, uh, or they're the right kind of bad, but they're going to sort of expire eventually. What are you going to do when they don't work? When, when the well, then, you, then you're going to have a limited, a limited run of what you can make with it. And so again, that's kind of what artists work with, is this idea that there's only so many. You know, there's going to be a rarity. I, mean, I guess my question is more like, you know, like looking 10 years in the future, like are, are all of the 3D printers that you can get your hands on going to be too perfect for the kind of art you want to do with them? Probably. Yeah, probably. But you'll move to something. And, and I'll probably have moved on to, to, to something different. Uh, maybe I'll have found something else, some other glitch uh, that happened in something newer. Um, or maybe I'll be uh, programming, programming glitches in, into the models themselves. I mean, there's artists that do that. They, they literally just throw in some nonsense into the code and see how that distorts the model. Uh, so, you, so you can play around that way as well. Um, but you're right. I mean, these, these machines are eventually going to fail completely. They, they'll be unusable. Um, and that, you know, this has been happening to artists for a long time. I mean, like, you know, printmakers have these old metal printmaking devices and uh, they eventually wear out. And then you, so you only get so many of this. And I think that's okay. You know, it just becomes, well, that became that period of time from here to here. And then there is no more. Uh, you can try to replicate it, but it's never quite the same. You know, and that's that's kind of how it goes, yeah. I have a question, Joe. On the last photo, can we look at it again? The sure. Um, <laughs> well, it's trash. Isn't that what you said it was? What's that? These are the pieces of trash that. Well, yeah, it's shards. It's ceramic shards. shards. Yes, yeah, so it is trash. I mean, it's sure it's trash. It is, it is considered trash. So first of all, I think the picture is also amazing that someone's walking by. So did you take that picture for the aesthetic of the picture, or just? To no, I just took. I, I, it was. This is just documentation, and the the person walking by is for scale, so you can kind of see that this is fairly large. Yeah. Okay. So my second question is. When it got replicated over and over again, did it did it get less precise? No, no. It, it is a perfect replication. This last set is exactly exactly the same as the same as the first set, and will and will be a thousand sets away. Will be exactly the same. So it's not that she's scanning the second one. 
producing it for everybody. No. She scanned once. She scanned one and she's producing very, she's, she's, she's been having my, the printers here at school going 24-7 going for, for, for months, actually, <laughs> uh, which I kind of like because then she'll wear them out and we'll get to buy new printers uh, because I actually don't like those printers. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, she's been, uh, she, yeah, she's been replicating. But, but, you know, she's actually taken this further to where this is, she tells me she wants to do this and we'll see what she actually does. What she wants to do is take this and then put it in a, in a mold and take ceramics and then make this again. <laughs> Which is, I'm not sure where she's going with all of that, but she's, she's, she wants to keep kind of playing with this of kind of back and forth, back and forth between you know, the repetitions. And, and I, I, again, I, you know, I haven't talked to her about what that's gonna lead to, where she'd stop. Um, and, and, or, or what, you know, really how the concept expands into that. But that's what she's interested in doing. She actually wants to do that as well and have some of them actually be repetitions in the same, pretty much the same material as the original. But then being, again, an exact replica of the shard, which is garbage. You know, so sort of calling uh, attention to something that we ignore, which is often sometimes what, what artists do. It's very meaningful at a time of automation, right? Too right that you can make it a million times and it's just exactly precise as it was the first time. Yeah, absolutely. You evacuate the humans. Hey, right, exactly. You evacuate the human. I mean, that's kind of the scary part. Is at, at what point um, are, are are we no longer interesting? Right. <laughs> that's why I wish that by the thousandth set it wasn't as good. Right, sure, right, because then you, you'd have a progression. You, you wish the machine would get tired. Right, yeah. right. You want to, well, see, when something is alive, right, that's what it does. It progresses from being very perfect and nice to decaying, right? right? That's, that's kind of what life is about, at least life as we know it, um, to where this isn't that at all. Yeah, it doesn't have that linear uh, time going on. Yeah. Yeah, going back to programming glitches, I was, um, while listening to you, I was curious um, if there's any interest in like figuring out the old well-known artist's glitches. Like I've heard of one who had eye deficit and they drew stuff like weirdly like squished from uh, the top and more like elongated. Yeah. So if there's an interest in figuring out those glitches and maybe producing, having them as presets or something and producing one as like Castle kind of glitches or, or whatever. Is there any interest? Um, so, right. So, there is, there is a, a piece, um, I, I think I know, I know which one you're talking about, um, where it, it's an artist was using, uh, I guess it was iVisit. This is back before Skype. Um, to where you'd get online and you'd talk to some random person because you really couldn't control who you're going to talk to, just who happened to be using you know, the, the software. And because of the bad internet, you know, if we're talking 56K modem internet, um, it created all kinds of weird, strange digital artifacts that looked very Picasso-esque. Everything was kind of broken up uh, and rearranged, right? Is this, is this the one you're talking about? Um, um, and, and so it, it started to look very much like fine art in the, the digital glitch. Um, and it was sort of happening over the network. And she kind of included that within the narrative of the piece as well. She, she wrote text with it between their communication and how we're all getting kind of fragmented and scattered and rearranged and this is what's happening to us. And certainly it is. I mean, she's sort of predicting uh, what's happening very much to us right now, how fragmented we are, especially our attention uh, these days, being pulled in all kinds of different, uh, different ways. Um, so, I mean, I think there, there are a lot of artists that are working in that direction. Um, I'm trying to encourage my students to, to, to look at things like this and to try to see where something that we normally try not to do, try to avoid, try to fix, that that becomes the headliner that becomes the thing that we're interested in. Um, and then how does that, what does it mean? How does it work? How do you work with it so it doesn't just look like a mistake to where it looks like something that's very intentional, in fact, extremely complex and intentional. Um, and so you have to work with it because you still have to make compelling artwork after all. Um, 
I mean, you know, I, I often have students ask me what I consider art to be, and I say, well, I'm, not, I'm not concerned what art is, I'm concerned what good art is. And so <laughs> you have to, you know, the idea is that you need to make something that's compelling, uh, finally, visually, uh, when, you're, when you're done with it. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm very much encouraging my students to, to explore this kind of thing. And, 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 and also myself, you know, I'm also looking into this kind of stuff as well. Uh, and actually all forms of digital art that I play with, um, I'm, I'm often co-opting uh, software to, uh, to do things that it wasn't meant to, to put it on the edge of, of, of its viability. Um, and so when I, when I was saying when we were having problems with, with this thing working uh, when, when I came up, up here, and I say I'm, this is happening to me all the time, is because I'm always on the edge of what it can do. And so I get errors constantly. Um, I'm always pushing machines and having to try and get a faster machine, and it's not quite fast enough. And then somebody comes up with an update of the software, and I'm saying, well, what if you did this with it? You know, what if you push it even further than that? And then I, I'm having to massage the errors out uh, to try and get it to work at all. Um, and then a lot of times I'll, I'll see new errors that I'm interested in, and I, and I try and repeat that or get it into a form that I'm interested in doing. Uh, so that's why I'm saying this, this becomes part of my life, is working in error. <laughs> so you're saying we can expect a, a new art piece that involves the, the zoom. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. Well, zoom is incredibly imperfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect model for this for kind of art. Exactly, exactly. Our students will be very upset if they heard you because all yeah, right. the starting points when their software behaves like the way it should behave. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's an entire movement that's been going on for many years now of, of internet art called you know, net art, net dot art. Um, and it's all based on commercial software that was meant for advertising and you know, to sell your product. That's supposed to work well, you sell your product, and that's what the internet was supposed to be, I, I guess, to, in a lot of people's eyes. That would be a big storefront. And artists started using it as a medium, saying, well, the internet is, is a canvas. And you can make weird, glitchy things and all kinds of experiences that you can distribute over the network. And you don't need galleries and museums anymore. Um, and so again, it's kind of just co-opted by artists' commercial software, which is a lot, of, a lot of what I do as well. And I think artists in general, digital artists in general, are doing this kind of thing. Software that was meant to do something else that really wasn't meant for art. Um, so you push it further. Would you consider giving your, uh, an award at the end of each class for a Best unintentional bug, right? That yeah, right. Some weird, like you know, art-like thing. There's a lot of bugs that are interesting. In fact, you know, uh, so 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 this is interesting. The, the the very first moving image that ever appeared on the internet before they could make anything move is all just text. Was done by an artist uh, named Jody. Uh, Jody.org is and she's still up making artwork, but she found a glitch in the browser that made these two images flicker and created the first animation ever to be seen on the internet by this glitch that she found. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. <laughs>